And so our topic for tonight is fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome, two of the more controversial and difficult to treat conditions. Um, <clears throat> but every day we have patients coming into our office complaining about these. And so Dr. Kent Haltoff is an expert on chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. In fact, at one point he ran multiple fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue centers all across the country. <clears throat> he's a director of the Holtoff Medical Group, and he's personally trained numerous physicians across the country in the use of bioidentical hormones, hypothyroidism, complex endocrine dysfunction, and innovative treatments for chronic fatigue, weight loss, fibromyalgia, and chronic infectious diseases, including Lyme disease. I'm sure you'll find that Dr. Holtoff has many interesting ideas. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Holtoff. Thank you so much. Yeah. We appreciate the invite. Uh, uh, very honored and really nice to meet some new people and some uh, familiar faces. So, thanks so much. And this is the, well, we'll get into the end of that. Um, okay, good. There we go. Sorry, I'll come further. So you know, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. Um, well, we're going to talk about immune modulation and peptides and stem cells, which has been, I think, probably the biggest uh, breakthrough in immune modulating therapies for chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, but again, the thyroid slides are usually three and a half hours, so I, but I, I took out just kind of the highlights and kind of the best, hopefully. So hopefully it's not jumping around too much, but I'll go pretty quick on the thyroid and then we'll see if we have any time. But uh, I think the big thing is get to the question and answers. Don't want to just be talking at you all, all night. And I think that's where most people learn the most and find it most uh, beneficial. But yeah, so we'll talk about thyroid dysfunction. Uh, we'll talk about um, pituitary dysfunction with the thyroid, the iodinase issues, and kind of the, the newest, um, really, I think, to get the best understanding of why someone has strange thyroid labs and how does it explain the TSH is normal and these patients have all these symptoms. Uh, and the TSH is very unreliable when you look at especially the thyroid transport. Uh, and that will let you it will be able to understand strange lab values or even especially chronic fatigue syndrome patients. Like why do they have usually low normal TSH, high normal T4, low normal T3? And it's mainly from thyroid transport issues. So we'll go ahead and talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about some alternative tests including how sex hormone binding globule, people think about it with testosterone, but it's a key um, uh, test for thyroid. This SHBG goes up in response to two things in the liver, the amount of estrogen and the amount of thyroid. So especially it's more discriminating for women because of wider range, mm -hmm. that if a woman's normally menstruating has normal estrogen levels, now it tells you what the thyroid level is. And so when you give thyroid, that should go up. If it doesn't, you know, they have thyroid resistance, so it's another piece of information that most of the time you know, doctors don't get it. And then we'll talk about the Thyroflex a little bit. I don't think I have a lot of slides on it, but British Medical Journal showed that a knowledgeable doctor looking at someone's ankle reflex was a better test correlating with symptoms better who would respond to therapy than blood tests. And what they found, a normal reflex goes but the lower the thyroid, the slower the relaxation phase. So there's a computer that you can actually measure that and which is key to show the patient you get real-time information showing look your low thyroid uh, we'll often check their basal metabolic rate or actually it's resting metabolic rate uh, and you show oh you don't you're only burning 800 calories a day you should be at 1400 and they're like you know tell me something i don't know but it's very validating uh, and uh, uh, these those other tests also we'll talk a little bit about medical legal but you want to be able to show you have an alternative method of diagnosis if you're just using the TSH, you know, you're going to get, if someone does make a complaint, you're going to be reviewed by a board endocrinologist, and it's very difficult to uh, fight that. So we want to show little things to, so you don't get in trouble. Um, we'll see if we get to adrenal dysfunction, uh, peptide therapy. Anyone know about peptides? Anyone doing them? Okay. Uh, so we'll try to mix it into question and answer, because I have a lot of slides, but. Um, and there's a handouts in there, we maybe go through the question and answer. And then stem cells, again, stem cells, 
we're finding, especially for Lyme patients, but also chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, that I won't see a patient that doesn't do stem cells because it's just, they get better much quicker. And like a big thing with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia is they have immune dysfunction. So they have uh, Th1, Th1 gets stuff inside the cell, Th2 gets stuff outside the cell. Usually they're balanced. With chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, also a lot of other chronic illnesses, Th1 is too low, Th2 is too high. So you don't have any cellular immunity, but too much, uh, basically extracellular. So especially in the classic case for this is Lyme disease. So you get tick bite, flea bite, whatever, a mosquito, wherever, however you get it, or in utero, um, goes in, your body pumps up the immune system, it starts suppressing your Th1. Uh, so then it goes inside the cell, now it's chronic, and you don't have Th1 to fight the infection. So the key is, is modulate the immune system, and by lowering the Th2, it's like a teeter-totter, raises Th1, the symptoms are much better because all the inflammation from Th2, now they can actually fight the infection. Um, so here's uh, from our uh, Fibonacci Fatigue Centers, you know, just basically how it is multifactorial, and you want to kind of compartmentalize everything. We'll show you, you know, how to look at it systematically. But there's certainly genetic predisposition uh, for chronic fatigue syndrome fibromyalgia. They don't make uh, serotonin as well, poor adrenal function, poor immune function, but those aren't causes. If they don't get some other issue, they'll be fine. But all of a sudden you add, you know, chronic infections, other illnesses, stress is a, is a big uh, thing that will often set everything off. So under the background, often of a chronic infection, uh, let's say Lyme, or they'll have, or can you go back up? Back. Uh, <coughs> physiologic stress, you get immune dysfunction, okay? And then lots of autoimmunity, low level autoimmunity, you'll see chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, where they get diagnosed with lupus, pre-lupus, you know, um, and then you get primary infections and secondary infections. So once that TH1 goes down, now they get other reactivating infections, such as Epstein-Barr, HH6, uh, mold plays a part. Then over here, it suppresses the pituitary. Uh, when you get immune modulation, when you get immune dysfunction, suppress the pituitary. We'll talk about that, how that results in low hormones, but the standard tests are normal, like TSH is normal, um, uh, adrenal dysfunction published a review on adrenal dysfunction and chronic fatigue syndrome, I think you guys have it, but they found that you know basically 90 plus percent of patients have adrenal dysfunction with chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, and any cortisol below 12 had about a 90% chance of being low adrenal. Um, mitochondrial dysfunction, and I know Metagenics has some products for that. We won't get too much into that, except the fact that we'll talk about it with transport. The transport is energy dependent. So low mitochondrial, this, uh, low mitochondrial function with really any chronic illness, but especially chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, um, and you'll get you know poor transport, poor energy, poor immunity, um, and that. I was talking to the uh, metagenics person about. He said, "Oh, I heard they have swollen mitochondria." Uh, went something to muscle biopsy in chronic fatigue syndrome patients. Looked at an electron scanning microscope. Ninety plus percent had big. You know, visibly dysfunctional mitochondria that weren't working. Uh, nutritional deficiencies, gastrointestinal, uh, won't get too much into that, but they all play a part, so uh, go ahead. I just want to throw this up. This is like, okay, Lyrica, you know, it's approved for fibromyalgia. Look at the difference. 5% difference is what, you know, 5% difference in, in 40, yeah, it's crazy. So, and also side effects, fatigue, weight gain, lethargy. So that's, we never use it. So there are treatable conditions uh, with the multi-system illness. When you treat these multi-systems, patients will almost always get better. This is an old study, but a classic uh, title bomb study, where you can see your multi-system treatment on patients, and then you see the um, treatment group here and then the placebo group, which was as, as you would think. So he found about 90% of people got better. And then we uh, published uh, our outcomes, uh, 500 consecutive patients, computerized outcome assessment in multi-system treatment. This is before we had stem cells and peptides, but still 94% uh, of the patients had overall improvement the fourth visit, 75% uh, uh, significant, substantial 62%. The average energy level and sense of well-being was doubled by the fourth visit. 
Then we went on to do, at all our centers, we have private medical centers, uh, effectiveness, over 40 positions, over 5,000 patients, and it really mirrored the smaller study. So we, we look at, hey, oh my gosh, well, these things are going on, where do you basically start? So we kind of broke it down. Number one, stabilize the patient, get them sleeping, um, you know, uh, uh, basically, to make sure their, their meds are okay, make, a, make sure the, the gut is okay, and then component two, start boosting the mitochondria, and these can be done at the same time, and then usually get labs, and then start treating the hormones, and we'll talk about that, and then component four, now we're starting to do, if anytime we're going to treat an infection, you need to treat the immune system in, uh, first. We're finding much better outcomes, and we'll uh, hopefully get to some ways that we can do that. Unique etiologies, um, immune activation of coagulation is huge. You'll find this in probably 70% of chronic fatigue syndrome patients. They'll have high D-dimer, high prothrombin fragment one and two, uh, thrombin antithrombin complex. And uh, when I had chronic fatigue syndrome actually in line, my D-dimer was 50, it should be 0.5, so it put me at about an 80-fold increased risk for cardiovascular event in a year. But you'll find that if you check uh, those in patients, Heparin can be huge because the body lays down this fibrin on, on the vessels. It's not a clot, but it's fibrin, and now hormones can't get in, waste products can't get out. Also, in treatments that didn't work, you clean that, that up, then all of a sudden they start working. Also, nanokinase, lumbrokinase uh, can also help. So those are just the different, same thing, but just uh, each different section in terms of uh, component. So we'll talk about thyroid, move on to that. Almost all chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia patients are low thyroid. Uh, they usually, again, have low normal TSH, high normal T4, and we'll talk about why. Thyroid resistance is common, so thyroid in the blood does not correlate with thyroid in the tissues, in the cells. Uh, right. And so here, um, I'll, I'll jump to this to kind of just summarize. This is about the deiodination. So this is one part of the picture. Now, the big thing to keep in mind is that the pituitary is completely different than every other cell in the body. And it's like we're using the TSH, and it's like the worst tissue to measure because it basically has uh, very potent thyroid receptors, uh, and the deiodinases uh, actually work opposite. So when you get all these conditions here, including chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, they'll actually they'll stimulate uh, type two deiodinase in uh, in the cell, which makes more reverse T3, uh, and then oh, let's go sorry, go over here. So the the T4 to T3 type 1 DNA is suppressed. So you get reduction in T4 to T3 conversion in the periphery of the cells. It will increase type 3 deiodinase, which makes high reverse T3, which actually blocks the thyroid and will show it's a marker for thyroid transport. Um, and then so you get the low T3 levels, high reverse T3 levels in the cell. The pituitary is actually completely opposite. It works on a different deiodinase, type 2 deiodinase, with all these things, it's not suppressed T1, uh, the type 1, it has type 2 deiodinase, which is stimulated. So with any chronic inflammation, chronic illness, the T3 level in the pituitary goes up, uh, and, the, uh, and so the TSH goes down, where all the other cells are starving for thyroid because they have very low T3 levels. Um, and that's, they'll have, you know, so that's why you see one reason, we'll see an even bigger reason why you have low TSH, and these patients are, you know, all the thyroid. Studies show all diabetic patients, I mean, this, uh, depression. So this study in Lancet performed thyroid biopsies on people that didn't even have to meet the criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome, but just be significantly fatigued. They found um, that 40% uh, of these patients had lymphocytic thyroiditis when they looked close, so inflammation of the thyroid. Now, of 40% of those with lymphocytic thyroiditis were, uh, only 40% were positive for TPO or anti-fibroglobulin uh, or had an abnormal TSH. So, uh, and they found treatment was effective regardless of the TSH concentration. So this is they tested with, with TRH, um, basically TRH, thyroid releasing hormone, you give it, it's a way to detect secondary and tertiary hypothyroidism, so from the hypothalamus and pituitary. Um, again, that's where TSH doesn't tell you. They, it's not available commercially anymore because they said, oh, you don't need it. Uh, so it's crazy, but it's much more accurate. 
and they found that all, every single fibromyalgia patient was low thyroid with a secondary or tertiary hypothyroidism, uh, but their lab tests were normal. And it, in fact, they were saying they tended to have a TSH that was 0.86 versus 1.42. So lower TSH associated with lower tissue levels of thyroid. And this is just looking at T3 levels with CRP. So even in a normal range, 0.4 to 2, you see this direct drop in, in uh, T3. So any inflammation is going to set this cascade off. So here's like this one to throw in dieting, uh, significant dieting. Uh, this study showed reduced T4 to T3 conversion by 50%. Um, now with that, again, you get increased type 2 deiodinase, so the pituitary uh, thyroid level goes up. So TSH drops, but the rest of the body is 50% less T3. And this is, this is a study where they found individuals who significantly dieted in the past had a 25% lower metabolism, so they were equal to a weight of someone of 60% less. They found even when the people went back to normal eating, there was still the reduction in metabolism. So when people say, I've wrecked my metabolism, they have. So uh, this is the fed the rats, um, obese rats, high fat diet. After two cycles of calorie restriction, they gain weight, much higher levels, and basically weight loss uh, at significantly lower levels. This is just uh, bioactive TSH. I'll throw it out there. That's like maybe too much. But also they're finding secondary and tertiary hypothyroidism has the TSH is less bioactive. So as the TSH is being processed in, in the pituitary, it starts cleaving carbohydrate moieties. Now, a long carbohydrate chain, it's very inactive. But as that's cleaved, it becomes more active. Now, when you have these chronic illnesses, the body puts out TSH too quick without cleaving it. So you can actually detect secondary and tertiary hypothyroidism if those people are going to have low TSH and shows that the TSH is not very active. Um, and then also differentiating primary, which is interesting, and then normal. So, Working on this, trying to get this test developed for about 15 years. I keep saying we're close, but. Uh, yeah. So we'll talk about thyroid hormone transport. So we basically, the body, the, people kind of just assume that thyroid diffuses into the cell. It doesn't at all. It's active transport. And the interesting thing, there's different transporters for T4 and T3. And now the, the transporter for reverse T3 has the same pharmacodynamics and same pharmacokinetics as reverse T3. So it shows if you have, and we'll, we'll get into this, if you have high reverse T3, it shows that T4 and somewhat T3 is not getting into the cell. So high reverse T3 shows T4 is not going to work on them. Okay, and all these chronic, you know, like depression, you'll, you'll see it, and they use the fact that patients are low thyroid because they gave T4 and it didn't work. What's well, the wrong medication? So this is just, you can see all the conditions associated with, so again, they're energy dependent. So any little mitochondrial dysfunction, all of a sudden you get this, they're low thyroid. So with all these conditions actually, diabetes, depression, we'll go through a couple studies, um, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, so you can see all those, even high cholesterol. So again, specific transporters, I can't see. Um, so again, uh, different transporters for T4 and T3. The transporter for T4 is much more energy dependent, which is why these patients, chronic fatigue syndrome fibromyalgia, do so much better with straight T3. Uh, even slight reduction in cellular energy results in, uh, results in dramatic declines in uh, uptake of T4. Again, so T4 goes up in the serum because it's not getting into the cell. So you see these people, Low normal TSH, high normal T4, low normal T3, and high, high normal reverse T3. Uh, again, pituitary, not affected. It will actually increase thyroid because of the inflammation. Okay. So, I mentioned that the difference of the pituitary. Um, so, this, yeah, the key is no pituitary is different, doesn't make reverse T3, different transporters uh, that are not energy dependent, high affinity receptors. Uh, if you drink it out of plastic water bottles, you know, uh, the, the BPA actually will block your thyroid receptor, but it won't block in the pituitary. They're resistant to that. So again, 
pituitary's fine, it's seeing tons of thyroid, the rest of your body's not. So how do you tell if uh, there's reduced thyroid transport? Again, reverse T3 transporter has the same program, same programmatics as T4. Uh, we talked about the main reason reverse T goes up with stress and chronic illness is that it's not getting into the cell. So again, so reverse T3, we'll talk about sex hormone binding globulin, useful indica indicators of poor T4 transport into the cell. And this is from one of the studies that we uh, published. You can see here that tiny bit of mitochondrial dysfunction the T4 will dramatically have less transport into the cell. T3 does as, as well, but it's not as energy dependent. So with these chronic illnesses, you want to be using T3 because that's going to get in the cell. The high reverse T3 tells you T4 is not getting in the cell. So don't use T4 for that. Okay. When, when you measure patients T3 reverse T3, do you find it? find a lot of patients with elevated reverse T3? We used to. Um, and what happened, they changed the reverse T3 assay from radio immune, uh, a radio immune assay, but they kind of got rid of it because of the kind of toxic uh, waste after it. Uh, and they switched to the gas chromatic mass spectrometer and they made it precisely more inaccurate. So what they did, everyone's now squeezed together where before, much more clinically useful, you would see high reverse T3, and we had Quest do a parallel for us when they told her to chain, we don't like this assay. They go, no, it's, it's good. So they send, oh, it correlates, yeah, it correlates, but 30% of the people were abnormal on the old assay, high, and they were abnormal. So it's much less discriminating. When you say that T4 is um, energy dependent, what, as what, as what aspect of it is energy? Yeah, yeah, so the low mitochondrial function, so these need energy from mitochondria to transport thyroid. So it's a rate limiting step, and as soon as you get any dysfunction in mitochondria, which you know, chronic disease, fibromyalgia, diabetes, heart disease, all those things, so then you know T4 is not going to get into the cell. Make sense? I'm going to this slide. It's true, and we'll, we'll talk about, because the pituitary is seeing so much more thyroid, if you give anything, it, I'll show you some studies that show that you can't get optimal thyroid without suppressing the TSH in anyone with chronic illness, especially with chronic pigs and fibromyalgia. It's already somewhat suppressed, so you look at, you know, they're coming in 0.5 to 0.8, where normal people are gonna be higher, so you're gonna suppress that TSH very quickly, but usually they need more. And we'll talk about what, yeah. I'm not worried so much about I'm just wondering why is the T4 going down when I have them on a little bit of nature? Oh, yeah, so. Or are they just converting to T3? No. Then, but why isn't T3? Yeah, no, so yeah, well, when you give T3, it's going to go into the cell, you know, basically, and then go in the pituitary as well, and it's going to lower TSH. Okay, but, and then so you're basically not going to produce much T4. So the more T3, it will never go to zero, but as you give T3, it suppresses T4. Okay, so you, it's normal to see it lower. Now we find some people do feel better with some T4, so I think it's a very good strategy. It sounds like you've found what kind of works for your patients, yeah. and that's exactly true. So, and in fact, we'll use some 50-50 uh, T4, T3 combinations, and that seems where a lot of people feel better. Some straight T3, um, and but there's not a lot of studies showing 50-50, but that's where we kind of found that, you know, nature, the nature thyroid or, you know, uh, basically, four to one, and just too much T4. So you're getting the high reverse T3 problems, you're not getting the T3. So usually, little T4, you know, let's say you're giving 25 a T3, probably 25 a T4. Yeah, or you can do nature's way and add them up. Yeah, we can talk about how to convert it. Um, let's see, demonstrate you have either increase, so we talked about that. And here's interesting, they took serum from non-stressed individuals and 
bathe the cells in that serum, there was no problem with thyroid uptake. But they had stressed individuals, they had up to a 44% reduction in T4 uptake into the cell. So they found thyroids around, but it's not getting into the cell. So yo-yo diets, all that. So uh, dysfunction present with depression and bipolar, again, reduced uptake of T4. Uh, and again, these patients thought to have high normal thyroid. And you look at, I've seen read so many papers where they go, oh, depressed people are high normal because they have low, get low normal TSH, high normal T4. Uh, and then they give them thyroid, T4, and they say, see, it didn't work. It proves they're not hypothyroid. Again, long medication. So here's a study. Uh, 159 bipolar patients, uh, they treated with T3 who had failed adequately respond to on average 14 different medications. Average dose, pretty big, you know, 90.4 micrograms. So anywhere from 13 to 188, which is getting up there, you gotta be careful with that. We can talk about the difference of T, time release T3 compounding. The problem is the PCA is a great service that the, that the pharmacies use to formulate their T3, but it's way too much methicil, which is a time-releasing agent. So anyone, any gut issues, it goes right through, it doesn't absorb. So you end up getting so much thyroid, like T3, because the time-release isn't absorbing, and it looks bad. I mean, really, what matters what you're giving, but you know, you have 300 micrograms on the chart, it doesn't, doesn't look good. What, what about using natural thyroid? Yeah, you, you can certainly do that. Add, add that, and then maybe add some T3. Um, but T4, T3, much better than T4. Uh, can you go back to the other slide, sorry. Yeah, so, yeah, so the medication was found to be tolerating 84%, uh, was well tolerated, 84% of patients experienced significant improvement and 33% had a full remission of their bipolar after trying 14 different medications without any improvement. One patient was switched to T4 for cost reasons, experienced return of symptoms, uh, which resolved after T3 was reintroduced, doctors included. Augmentation with superphysiologic. What does superphysiologic mean? Suppressed TSH. Um, okay. Star report, largest study ever done on antidepressants, showed that 66% of patients will fail antidepressants. Uh, T3 was a better antidepressant, safer with less side effects than all the um, uh, antidepressants used. But it's interesting, it's in the study, but it never made it to the... Uh, <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, that it, it, it didn't make it to the abstract, because you know, it was all supported by all the antidepressant companies. Good try. So this is just a graphic representation uh, that we did for looking at when you get more chronic illness, even just aging uh, here with the poor transport in the cell, what goes up quickest is reverse T3. Because reverse T3, again, is not getting into the cell. Now T4 we mentioned is the same, but the problem is as T4 is not getting into the cell, it raises it, but now the TSH is suppressing, so you're not making more T4. So it's kind of a, a battle between making less but absorbing less. So again, no transport, it goes up, but you're not making T4, so you'll see it go up. Then as the TSH gets suppressed, it goes down. TSH will actually go up a little bit, with, and then down here, and then free T3 will be more linear. So you look at what's the best test for low thyroid, these chronic illnesses. The TSH isn't good, it's gonna be in normal range. T4 isn't good, it's gonna actually show high. So you look at reverse T3, T3 ratio, free T3 ratio. Um, okay. And here's just a study when you look at the sensitivity and specificity of particular symptoms. And you look at ankle reflex, it has a a 77% sensitivity, but a 93% specificity. So if it shows, you know, basically patients have slow relaxation phase, 93% specific. 
Uh, even just puffiness, like you know, people that are puffy, you're a good chance to tell me you're low thyroid, you're right. Lack of sweating, weight increase, uh, cold hands, cold skin. You know, I was asking if they wear socks to bed, positive sock sign, they're all low thyroid. <laughs> but you'd be surprised how many do. And here's, you want to add something to really have the patient fill out, so you have that in their chart. Someone says, oh, you shouldn't give her thyroid, and you can even just use the, the symptoms and go back to that study and look at, you know, here's, here's what, what you likely have. That's just, you know, hey, you're in the normal range. I wouldn't seen that, right? <laughs> so best method to diagnose, look at the free T3 reverse T to ratio. Uh, and generally, free T3 should be above 3.5. Now, it depends is when you check the thyroid, right? If you take the thyroid before, T3 is going to go up and come down. We'll usually check it 24 hours later. That's really what you got to realize what you're trying to achieve. We're trying to show it's not too high because we kind of know. And But you can do it six hours later uh, and, and see. But you'll see it different. Now, again, thyroid's a nuclear receptor. So it, the fluctuations don't matter very well. It's actually slow on and slow off. It takes a week to, to basically for, the, for it to come on, goes into the nucleus, changes protein synthesis, so it like builds a factory and then it has effects. Now, the side effects you'll see, especially heart palpitations, is from a surface, re uh, a surface a cell surface calcium channel in the heart and you get palpitations. So it's the reason why you don't want too much fluctuation that you can see with cytomel, you'll get much higher levels of palpitations. Um, reverse T3 uh, should be less than 16. Again, the RA was much better though. TS TSH greater than two is significant, and usually you want it low or suppressed, uh, partially suppressed or low. Um, again, use a low normal free T3, high above average uh, reverse T3. Look at signs and symptoms of that body temp pulse, cold. SHBG, um, if you find it less, it should be actually 80 to be optimal uh, in women. So if that's low, it's an objective evidence that they're low thyroid. And, uh, and then men also should be above 30. With men, it's not as uh, good of a test because usually as you know, women get older, they have less estrogen. Men make more estrogen, so the sex hormone binding goes up. So it's not as specific for men. Uh, Basic metabolic rate, a leptin above 12. Actually, so when, when people gain weight, the body increases leptin, which then tells the brain, hey, stop storing energy. When you have inflammation associated with that, leptin goes up, but the brain doesn't see it. So the leptin tells the body to store fat. Uh, and you can check that and have a leptin level of 12. They have leptin resistance. Sometimes it can have severe leptin resistance without even insulin resistance, but often they go together. Um, and, uh, and then the leptin is also required to make TSH. So when you have leptin resistance, the TSH is going to be lower. And then dermatic marker panel. Uh, high C4A, eosinophilic cation protein. Eosinophilic cation protein is a great test if anyone's uh, looking at you know, treating Lyme. It goes up with parasitic infections, and oftentimes it's high normal. As soon as you treat them with something for the parasite, that it will go up. And so it's an objective measure that they have. Usually Babesia. You often see uh, you know people with Babesia. They'll get more severe symptoms. They'll have uh, you know, terrible brain fog, muscle pain, night sweats is, is the quintessential um, uh, symptom of that. NT4 are not optimal, uh, we, we talked about that. Sorry, I keep edging that. Um, so this interesting study, they measured thyroid levels in hypothyroid animals in 10 different tissues, sliced up their, their tissue, uh, I don't want to that, but uh, receiving T4, they checked plasma T4, T3, uh, TSH in 10 different tissues. Um, the amounts demonstrating that all the tissues except the pituitary would require super physiologic levels of T4 to provide normal levels of T3 in the cells. Uh, the pituitary again was able to maintain the levels of T3 to fight through, despite the rest of the body being low. Um, so again, TSH is not an accurate uh, measure. And so with the patient again, T4 preparations uh, are not gonna Get, get the cells the thyroid. Um, yeah, so normal T4 and T3 in the serum, 
did not ensure tissue, uh, uh, normal levels in, in the tissues. Uh, yeah, go on. Uh, this is just a study that showed that what's the chance of someone is hyperthyroid with a suppressed TSH? It was 23%. And then another study, suppressed TSH is not diagnostic of hyperthyroidism. Problem is they'll go to their doctor and say you're hyperthyroid. Patients like pulse is 55 and you know they're fatigued. They're like, nope, TSH suppressed and they'll freak out. So you got to it's, be careful with patients who have another doctor, especially endocrinologist, you you need to take extra uh, precautions. So always document pulse. If they have a high pulse, don't go up on the thyroid. Uh, you really want to use an alternative means to diagnose low thyroid. Because again, if you're using the TSH, someone, something happened, the medical board, like, well, what, what else did, did you do? So, and you're an alternative practitioner, and that needs to be clear if you go to a medical board case because there's a significant um, respectable minority rule where you don't, you're not judged by endocrinologists or you know, people in that field. There are other significant respected groups, you know, A4M, all these integrative doctors that treat this way. Uh, so it's key, uh, document more if you suppress the TSA. Do you want to educate the patient? Um, do you want to document an alternative means of diagnosis and that patient understands this is not standard therapy? Uh, we have it on the bottom of our progress notes, and you just check it out. Um, again, time release T3, cardiac effects. Go ahead. So, if that's the thyroid, you want to go on to adrenal or take some questions? Or what do we do? Yeah, you just want to start QA or you want to talk a little more? Yeah, okay. Go, yeah, go, go ahead. So this is a review article um, that I did, uh, assessed 150 studies and assessed adrenal, fun adrenal function and chronic fatigue syndrome in fibromyalgia patients. Um, they it, uh, review found the majority of patients had a normal adrenal function, mainly due to the hypothalamic pituitary dysfunction. So it's really not an adrenal problem, it's an HPA axis uh, problem. A, uh, ACH stimulation tests are shown no better than flipping a coin. Um, and so not, they're not re recommended. Um, and that's what, you know, all the endocrinologists, they found if you give it one day, fine, try it the next day, uh, no good. So a much more safe, it's much safer um, than doing the test is actually giving treatment. It's extremely safe. Um, oh yeah, and so the study also found was chronic fatigue syndrome fibromyalgia, very similar of course, you know, different groups that use an assessment method. But we found that the uh, CFS patients had more of a pituitary problem and the fibromyalgia patients had more of a hypothalamic problem, um, which kind of makes sense with the, with, uh, the pain center and the hypothalamus. So there's some, you think, ones, you think you got it there, there, um, look at that study. Study in the Bra uh, Brazilian Journal of Infectious Disease. So these were patients with chronic infections, uh, which you'll find chronic fatigue syndrome patients, fibromyalgia, they have chronic infections vicious cycle with, with the immune dysfunction. They found 12 had the um, best combination of specificity uh, and sensitivity was 12. Um, and that specificity over 90% if their cortisol was not over 12, their morning cortisol. Um, and again, they found that ACH did not rule out secondary hypoadrenalism, um, but if they have, do have a uh, abnormally low ACTH, so ACTH, same like TSH, stimulates cortisol and aldosterone, um, that, that's confirmatory. And this is just from the study, sensitivity specificity. So 12, so we go on, we'll go on a, a little bit of immune dysfunction. Um, yeah, go on a little more. Yeah. So, yeah, so a big thing that we're really now uh, addressing, you know, didn't really address this thing with chronic and fibromyalgia, all those different areas, but we're finding immune modulation generally is going to produce the re results quicker. Um, and so again, Th1, Th2, Th1 too low, Th2 is too high, and we'll talk about what, what right. tests you By should way, how do you test for cortisone? Uh, we, just, test? Yeah, well, we just do blood, okay. but it does, a lot of people will have, let's say, normal during the day and then high at night. Um, and so I do think the you know four point saliva tests are helpful. Um, so there's just a couple studies showing that with chronic fatigue syndrome, again, 
low TH1, high TH2. And this is showing that uh, HIV patients, you can judge how fast they're going to decline to AIDS based on their level of TH1 uh, and level of TH2. So high TH2, low TH1, they're going to progress much faster. So you know, a lot of immune modulators that people don't think are immune modulators um, uh, that you're, I'm sure you're using in, in your practice, um, and immune dysfunction, inflammation, major cause of underlying diseases, uh, chronic disease, fibromyalgia, depression, anxiety, cardiovascular disease, autoimmune, fertility issues, uh, addictions, uh, and many more. And uh, we'll, we'll show how to test for it. That's this with chronic Lyme, which we don't want to get in the weeds with that, but um, that's what you see with these chronic Lyme patients get, they over time, they get worse and worse TH1, higher and higher TH2, and they usually go about eight years on average without a diagnosis. A lot of them never get diagnosed, but they get diagnosed with chronic consider fibromyalgia, migraines, Alzheimer's, uh, PCOS, PMS, you know, they have, doctors will say, well, you have 25 different diagnoses, you know, well, what about one causing them all? So these are a lot of immune modulating uh, therapies. So we're going to talk uh, a little bit about peptides, which are kind of changing the way we practice and uh, build towards stem cells. Here um, um, other ones: LDN, heparin transfer factor, ozone, uh, LDI, LDA high dose B12 even, so um, B venom. So all those things are immune modulators. I don't know if some people probably use some of those. Oh, I like amino modulators, yeah. The only problem is it's, it's expensive. Yeah, and, and it's going up in price, seems like every month, and insurance will rarely cover it. Is it all? That what? Yeah, and so that's, and really these treatments are also being monitored for cancer. Uh, we'll look at thymus and alpha-1 peptide is approved in over 30 different countries for cancer, chronic infections. So again, anything that works for these chronic infections works for cancer. So if you, and um, I don't have the slide, but they gave chemotherapy to patients and looked at their, you know, basically TH1, TH2, and those that had the most dysfunction weren't cured and relapsed, the ones that had the best immunity were fine. So, yeah, I don't know how much you want to, you know, so, and there's, you have a chart there, I know it's kind of hard of where you start, but. Well, I think, I think peptides are something a lot of us are not familiar with, and it's kind of intriguing, so, yeah, why don't we keep going? Yeah, so, um, vitamin and alpha-1, we, and we have a little starving thing, so, that we kind of ramp patients up. We usually do BPC first, and we'll, we'll talk specifically about these. What, what's a BPC? Um, body protection compound for gut. It's the best thing for leaky gut. We do, I'll have a slide on it like this. So yeah, so fighting proteins, immune modulators, thymus and alpha-1, boost TH2, oh, this is boost TH1, uh, thymulin, thymus and beta-4, immune modulator, and then again, the BPC really lowers that inflammation. Pineal proteins I won't talk a lot about, but huge studies showing increase in telomeres and longevity. People live much longer, uh, less cardiovascular disease. The nootropics are uh, peptides for memory. Uh, studies show it works for depression, anxiety, improved memory, even in healthy patients. You can give it, and all these are extremely safe. It's the chance of a side effect is very low. Like you saw the description? Yeah. And then antimicrobial peptide, uh, we're finding adding that to Lyme patients. Um, it punches a hole in cell walls in less than a minute. Uh, Folostatin, great for weight loss and muscle gain, and then the BPC. Antimicrobial peptide, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, it shows it's better at killing the Lyme cyst than tinidazole. And it went head to head with tinidazole. So it's kind of just what I said. The BBC, I think you you probably could use that. Probably you know start with that. You can do it orally for any gut inflammation. It heals ulcers. It prevents from toxins. Um, 
uh, neurotoxins. It will, it will basically protect from alcohol. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of amazing. It increases healing of joints and uh, tendons. It protects the brain. Um, no tropics, again, uh, brain function, memory, depression, anxiety. Uh, the growth hormone releasing peptide, you know, combination with growth hormone releasing hormone for growth hormone increase. And, you know, growth hormone can help a lot of these patients. Um, I think it's overblown in terms of a normal person taking it in terms of, uh, although some people, especially if they work out, they'll notice the difference. But the sick patients do much better on, uh, with more higher growth hormone. You'll find they're somewhere extremely low. Again, pituitary dysfunction. So they're not making the growth hormone, they're not getting deep sleep at night. That's when you make growth hormone, which then goes through the um, liver and makes IGF-1. IGF DP3, so that is the main effect. You don't check growth hormone, you check IGF1, IGF DP3. Um, a battalion, let's see, um, PT141 works for erectile dysfunction pretty much 99.9% .9 of the time, even people that don't have an effect from Viagra Cialis. Uh, those things. This almost seems like a complete alternative form of medicine. Oh, it's, it's, it's changing our practice. Yeah, they mostly are sub-Q, yeah, and BPC is also sub-Q and oral. And so you just take them and you can see the dosing on there, but the dosing on that sheet, the LL37 is not correct. It's too high of a dose, so we gotta get that off of there. Uh, you usually want, you add five cc's to a 10 milligram, five milligram vial, start at even just number three, then number five. People can't hurt on the LL37, so you wanna go really slow. Um, Delta inducing, uh, sleep uh, or the epithelium again, cardiovascular disease and cancer, uh, dramatic reduction that long term. Uh, people live longer, so a lot of long term studies on that. Delta sleep inducing peptide, it doesn't work as a sleeping med. You don't get sleepy, but you get deeper sleep. And studies also show that it reduces pain, um, and maybe these kids are getting uh, better sleep. Again, polystatin, uh, weight loss, muscle gain, it's a little expensive, and the LL37. Yes, according to the uh, Center of Disease Control, approximately 80% of age individuals are affected with at least one chronic disease as a result of decline in thymic function. So the thymus involutes over time, uh, especially anyone who's uh, overweight or has chronic inflammation. Um, and the majority of people also have pineal gland calcification, so Everything you know uh, just starts starts declining. So, uh, and these are uh, compared to hormones. Hormones are very slow on, slow off. They work on nuclear receptors. Um, they'll tend to have more side effects. Peptides are more specific, uh, less side effects, uh, faster acting. So the thymic peptides again, the immune modulators, uh, and there's so many studies. I mean thousands of studies, if, like, when you read the studies, you're like, why have I never heard of this? It's crazy because it's too far out. It's been, most studies were um, in Eastern Bloc, Europe, and they can't patent it here, so there's no interest in it. Um, improved repair and healing, so these are in the, the thymocins, uh, thymocin alpha-1, thymocin beta-4, thymolin, reverse immunosuppression, the chronic, the, uh, chronic the syndrome, chronic Lyme, Increase antioxidant and glutathione production, boost natural killer cell function. Now, all these peptides are naturally occurring in the body, or some of these. Yeah, some are a little altered, but most of them are from the body. Yeah. Uh, cardiac regeneration, so you'll see, um, especially with uh, thymus and beta 4, dramatic improvement uh, after post traumatic uh, uh, brain, to try and brain injury, stroke, uh, increased nerve healing. Uh, Alzheimer's will, will see benefit. Uh, we use them with the stem cells. They actually boost stem cell activity. So they're very synergistic, increase longevity, um, almost non-existent side effects. A lot of studies, a hundredfold, thousandfold dose, and no side effects. Proven over, the thymus alpha one proven over 30 countries as cancer treatment, uh, chemotherapy adjunct, treatment of hepatitis B and C, treatment of AIDS. It's approved here as an orphan drug, um, but you can't get it. Um, How did you learn about all these peptides? Is there well, you know, when I was sick, I just started, started searching. And I, I was going to Belgium to get them, 
to bring them back to myself, and then um, was at uh, one of the conferences and saw a peptide manufacturer, a tailor made, and I'm like, holy crap, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so basically started using them and uh, found benefits, so started using the patients. And we were um, able to distribute them, but we hit it in the like, regulatory issues are, are really big, but this with anything. So we're, we're trying to get around that. But this is again, uh, key helper cells, they'll increase the, the TH1. So this is Zidaxin, which it is, and uh, it's proved uh, as the Zidaxin in Europe. Um, and you'll get, you know, basically the TH1 will go up, TH2 goes down. So are, are all of these approved medications? They're, you know, honestly, they don't know, they're not, they're not illegal, but they're they're also not approved as, as medications. So they're yeah they're not FDA approved, but they would be supplements. Um, but you can't take them orally. So that's where the um, the, the little problem is. That's what we're we're trying to work on. Except but the it's a BPC, yeah. Uh, which take BPC uh, little shot. It gets more systemically. Take it orally. You get some but it really heals the gut very quickly in most cases. So showing natural killer cell function uh, going up significantly, uh, minus an alpha one. Uh, this is showing thymus and beta four is uh, restorative regenerative for neurologic injury and neurodegenerative diseases. So BPC, body protection compound, originally isolated from the gut. Uh, it protects and heals inflammation uh, in the gut. Again, key treatment for a leaky gut. Uh, significant beneficial inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and we'll probably have a supplement that has uh, immediate release for stomach, immediate release for leaky gut, and then long release for ulcerative colitis um, and uh, the large bowel disease. I've never heard about this. It's had no, it is. issues with the leaky gut. Everybody's yeah. looking for a solution. Yeah. No, it's just, it is. It's just like you see the massive amounts of studies. So, quick, so quick question. You said you're going to have a supplement for? Yeah. So, when? I hope in a month. Yeah. So, how, how will that be made available to us? Um, our patients? I don't know. We've got to market it. <laughs> <laughs> but so you'll keep all of us on your mailing list. Yeah, yeah. You can uh, if you go to our we have a nonprofit site, National Academy of Hypothyroidism, NA Hypothyroidism dot org. We have a we're uh, doing training courses and peptides and stem cells and uh, any other thing. Um, so uh, with those oh uh, NA Hypothyroidism dot org, National Academy of Hypothyroidism. Yeah, so um, let's see. Yeah, protects the liver from toxic insults, alcohol, antibiotics, promotes healing, uh, protects against negative effects of acute chronic stress, including um, ulcers. The cells survive longer uh, with BPC than when under uh, extreme stress. Prevents and reverses toxic damage, environmental, neuro, and neurotoxins, mycotoxins. Increases growth hormone and prevents and inhibits arrhythmias. So we give it some of the APID and it's gone away. This is like unbelievable. I know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> so it's all, you know, lowers the inflammation. Have you uh, worked with a, any ALS patients with this? Well, we've had a number of ALS patients. We yeah. haven't, I haven't seen any other doctors may have, um, before we had stem cells and peptides, we treat a bunch of ALS patients, and you know, but the numerous neurologists that you know they're just going to die, live with it, you know, to, to pass away, and they're jogging now. So, ALS is Lyme until proven otherwise. Use AOD for arthritis. Yeah, I guess I didn't mention that. Yeah, um, it, it's on the. Uh, I think it's on the list that you have. So um, AOD is a fragment of growth hormone. Um, so it has the effects of growth hormone. It doesn't increase IGF-1, um, but you'll, you'll get the effects of growth hormone. Great for joint injections. When we do joints, um, 
we'll do, we, we do prolozone, we'll add the peptides to it, and especially add, if we do a stem cell injection, add peptides to it, especially thymus and beta-4. Um, we can give you the recipes and stuff, the a BPC um, and AOD, we'll add those three to the injections, and you can just even do the peptides, you'll see significant improvement. This is antimicrobial peptide. I, I guess I don't want to chew much in there, but it um, rapidly kills an usually broad range of bacteria, fungi, parasites, viruses. Um, it uh, selectively against the prokaryotic membrane, so very safe for human cells. It also has multiple modes of action, immune modulating. It boosts mesenchymal stem cell migration, immune modulatory effects. Very good. At anti, it's an antibiofilm, uh, even at minuscule levels. Um, now the, the minimal infect uh, uh, effective concentration is much lower in vivo than in vitro because it has not only direct effects but uh, immune modulating effects. Again, synergistic with antibiotics and re prevent the development of resistance. Effective against free Borrelia spirochetes and cystic forms. Uh, uh, even at low dose blocks the endotoxins and mycotoxins that um, uh, you can get from a uh, number of infections, uh, Lyme, um, like it it's one for gut that they get after they get antibiotics. Yeah, we know endotoxins are involved in IBS as well. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So toxins. oral, uh, you know, oral VPC and LL37, you'll find dramatic improvement. It will bind the binds the toxins and will directly kill them. Um, a little caution with autoimmune diseases. Because it's uh, it it is actually not really, but that's what some of the studies say. Because you'll have uh, basically high LL thirty seven from autoimmune disease. But autoimmune, I'm telling you, look at the studies. Ninety plus percent, probably hundred percent, are caused um, are caused by chronic infection that's driving the autoimmune. You get rid of the infection, and the autoimmune will almost oftentimes go away. So the body secretes more LL thirty seven with chronic infection, so it's going to be associated with autoimmune disease, but no direct evidence. This is just how it punches a hole in um, numerous ways in the, uh, in the prokaryotic membranes. Actually, one minute, you see like tobramycin took 16 hours to have an effect. Uh, nootropics or you know, neurotropics, nootropics, uh, similar to that of nerve growth factors. Uh, uh, peripheral and central nervous uh, stimulation, neuroprotective effects, shield-neuron from neurotoxin. You see a lot of commonality in the, in the peptides where they're shielding from, you know, uh, toxins and uh, immune modulatory protects from stress and depression, improves memory, even healthy patients, neurodegeneration, traumatic brain injury. Um, I don't know if I have all the, I don't know all the drugs in this, but Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, stroke, and no significant side effects reported. So stem cell we're finding is a big, also a big addition uh, to our practice. And again, I think I mentioned that I don't see patient unless the Lyme patient, the chronic peaks of fibromyalgia, that unless they do stem cells and peptides, because it's just, you're just banging on them and a lot of things take too long. And you have to go through it get worse, better, so it speeds things up dramatically. Um, direct replacement of injured tissue with growth of mesenchymal stem cells, very minimal. Very, the stem cells don't generally go to the area and start replicating or replace the tissue. They will, they secrete, they're very smart, they secrete different things depending on what the illness is. So if you have autoimmune disease, secrete one package of uh, growth factors and cytokines. If you have an infection, you'll secrete another path. You get these from bone marrow? Uh, no, so the problem is with these chronic illnesses, is that your own stem cells suck. You know, it's just, when you look at all the, the long-term effects of toxins, medication, age, inflammation, for instance, they're not even uh, shown to respond to a chronic infection, they've just done responding, and they're just very suppressed. And you look at um, uh, bone marrow and adipose tissue replacement and diabetics, uh, use of that, dramatically reduced success, because again, the stem cells aren't there, they should be working uh, already. So, uh, so the umbilical cord, much higher activity, much higher regenerative property, much higher healing. Never been any issue. Don't need to cross match. So you get these from a uh, stem cell bank. Yeah, 
Yeah, and there's a number out there. We uh, we work with a couple that we can um, uh, line line up for you. Um, protects against stress and use apoptosis, stimulation and revascularization. Um, the, uh, and they really how they work. They go. The uh, actually studies show even the, the, okay, they go to the tissue and start secreting stuff to uh, have your own stem cells boosted, but they have membranes that they don't even allow it to go there, and they'll secrete the stuff in almost as good an effect when it doesn't even can't even reach the uh, the area. Controversy whether they cross the blood-brain barrier. Probably people are sick, you know, open blood-brain barrier. They, they probably do, but studies show they probably don't need to because they're affecting. All the cytokines and the serum and uh, super spinal fluid, and then that will get in. So again, this is kind of about you know your own stem cells with these chronic illnesses just uh, don't work well, or uh, they get poisoned by endotoxins, lifestyle, uh, medications. You can't uh, for injections of stem cells and joints. Don't you can't use any lidocaine. Um, because they'll, they're toxic to the stem cells. Yeah, so this is basically what we said. The, um, the um, uh, autologous, meaning the bone marrow and adipose tissue, they have loss of ability to secrete numerous cytokines, peptide barriers, growth factors, antimicrobial peptides. They have reduced anti-inflammatory effects, reduced, uh, reduced immune modulatory. They don't self-renewal and they don't replicate very well. Um, so the viability is just is not there in the effect anymore. This is just some studies, review articles showing the core stem cells is the new gold standard. I won't go through this, but this just shows how the antimicrobial effects of, of stem cells. Um, so great to give, now they're doing it for cancer as well. Um, uh, synergy between peptides and um, stem cells. Again, the thymus and beta-4, a number of things will boost, especially thymus and beta-4, BPC, LL37. Uh, younger MC secretes significantly more antimicrobial and immune modulating peptides. Uh, they enhance bacterial clearance uh, and very low any, you know, any infection rate. I think it's, it's approaching zero, much higher risk of infection from autologous, from your own bone marrow or fat. So here's a thymus and beta 4 increased potency of transplanted mesenchymal stem cells for myocardial repair. Um, stem cells are, are great for heart failure. I went into heart failure because uh, of Lyme, couldn't walk, you know, two steps. I had to remember going all over the, you know, over the world, the country for treatment, and I was pulling my bag in New York, and I couldn't stand up, and I'm just like walking like two steps at a time. And um, Dr. Cardiology is like, you may get 10% better over 10 years, and back to normal. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's not being able to breathe. So. Are there studies using this on a large number of patients with heart failure? Yeah, there's a lot of huge, like the, the amount of studies is going way up, but there's there's studies showing the difference here. And a lot of people you'll see it somewhat immediate, where it just reduces the inflammation, also the heart pumps better, and then you'll get the long term uh, remodeling. Question for me. Um, the studies that quote that um, your autologous stem cells versus the ones that you're referring to, the umbilical, um, <clears throat> it, are there significant studies? Because I keep reading about how just you know pulling it out of the bone marrow from your hip is actually very beneficial. So are there particular diseases where they really don't respond? Yeah, I mean, the sicker the person, the less they're going to respond. And now bone marrow is more hemopoietic stem cells. And good and bad is they don't have the, as much rejuvenating power, but they have more immune modulating. So we'll sometimes use mesenchymal stem cells, and then a little umbilical cord stem cells, which is the hemopoietic. And then we add amniotic, which are growth factors, and the peptides is our general formula for most. Yeah, so just when to expect Lyme, um, you know, they have chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, more severe forms. The weirder the symptoms, the more likely it's Lyme, um, especially neurologic, autonomic symptoms, um, and the more immune dysfunction. We'll show you what labs to 
that you can usually quickly get to the diagnosis. Uh, let me uh, let me ask a question. How do we know that Lyme disease isn't just the chronic disease du jour of the day? Um, I mean, you look at you know the studies, and we actually had a, um, uh, a, a microscope and also immunofluorescing antibodies, which are very specific, very low instance of false positives. And it was just we could pretty much get okay, you're going to be positive. Um, and, uh, and when we see it ourselves, we also look at the studies. How it's just you know, and, and if you look at people who had Lyme disease, get treated with the standard doxycycline for two to four weeks, about 80% will relapse some some point down the line. Especially you add other things, you know, someone who's totally healthy may fight off Lyme. I think it's more like chickenpox that you don't ever get over it, but your body suppresses it. So you get chickenpox, they grow over it, it comes back out of shingles. I think Lyme is, is more like that, that it's hard to get rid of, especially co-infections with Amicia. How, how many of your patients with Lyme actually test positive for Lyme? Well, it's, it's a matter of you know, what test you're using. And there's certainly, okay. well, what the, test you yeah, uh, there's debate on what, so the standard is a standard Western blot from Quest and Lab 4. That will miss about 80% of people. Now, if you, um, especially if you do the two-tier test, the, um, where you just look at all the antibodies together, uh, it's, it's extremely insensitive. Um, now, if you're going to do that, you want to treat with antibiotics first. And actually, the sicker the patient with Lyme, the less bands they have, because the body just, it's, the immune system is shot. And you don't make, um, you need the Th1 to convert from I, I, IgM antibody, which are not very good. They just kind of hold on to the, the thing, where the IgG induces complement and kind of allows it to explode. But you'll find a lot of times when you, let's say they're positive, you treat them with some antibiotics just to stimulate or give them peptides to boost the immune system. Uh, then they'll have a certain amount of different bands. Then they'll, especially IgM is mostly positive. Then, because it's not like you think, oh, this is, good, this is new, IgM is new, they've had it for a long time, they just can't convert IgM to IgG. Then after treatment, you do it again, now they have different bands, especially IgG. So, yeah, I had so, originally... So what testing do you like for that? Yeah, so, um, and just, yeah, so originally I had uh, one band, and then I had eight bands, and then you know, it goes back down. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the problem is, is some of the uh, better tests, like Hygienix, you still want to provocate for them, the Western blot. PCR, don't, don't bother. Um, and that's more sensitive, it will still miss some. There are some urine PCRs that, it, they have good science on it, I just, uh, you know, PCRs are, are, tend to be insensitive. Um, and so you'll find some people with, like, totally, you know, multiple, uh, co-infections and Lyme, but their parent, like their parents will have like the exact same combination, so it makes me believe it. Um, but, uh, so there, there are a number of other tests, but well, I'll show you uh, a better way to actually test um, indirect methods. So this looks at the immune dysfunction, um, and so low natural killer cell function. So with chronic fatigue syndrome, you'll have about 30% of people have low natural killer cell number. That's generally, LabCorp does that. Quest does, they have a number, but also a activity. So it tests how active the natural killer cells, and about 70% of people with chronic fatigue syndrome are low, and about 100% of the Lyme patients. Um, Quest has an immune cell function, which measures the amount of ATP production by the uh, immune system. Uh, that's low in low CD57, which is natural killer cells with LabCorp. Elevated C4A, Probably they need to send it to National Jewish on, on dry ice, but that C4A tells you the high TH2. So high C4A and then uh, high human transforming growth factor beta are great markers for TH2. Then natural killer cell function uh, is the best part, the best marker for TH1. Now other things you, you can see, um, VEGF goes up with Bartonella, it's suppressed by molds. Now in Bartonella and vascular endothelial growth factor basically stimulates blood vessels. And I had the biggest blood vessel, it was like freaky. Um, and I finally went to, a, um, got a sclerosed, and then got rid of the Bartonella on my veins real quick. But um, ESL cation protein again goes up with obesity, but may only increase after some treatment. Androgen's converting enzyme, the normal level is uh, five to 60, but I don't think I have a, the, the slide here, but it showed that, um, People in non-endemic areas were above 30. People in Lyme endemic areas had between 
20 and 40. Uh, and, uh, and then um, people with, I'm um, oh, sorry, it's the other way, it's screwed up. Uh, so it's high with, with Lyme. Generally, it doesn't, it's not totally uh, sensitive, but if you find it um, greater than 30, then that's a, that's a marker. So immune activation of coagulation. So again, the body will, with, with these chronic infections, will start secreting, um, laying down fiber, trying to wall off the infection initially, which is good in the short term, but now the stuff's hiding under there and your body can't get at it. So you, you can check this, and you'll be surprised how many people are positive. D-dimer, soluble fiber monomer, prothrombin, fragment one and two, thrombin antithrombin complex, and uh, pi one. And if any of those markers are positive, then they have this immune activation of coagulation. So um, well, oftentimes I mentioned heparin can be a miracle for, for patients. You can also go the route of lumbrokinase and matokinase. Uh, low IgG subclasses, they'll go to the neurologist and they'll tell them it's genetic. Um, they probably still won't treat them, but that often reverses when you get rid of the infection. Again, we talk about leptin above 12. Human transformative growth factor beta is, is a good one. And most really, so normally you need five bands on the IgG uh, Western blot and two bands on the IgM. And what we're finding is that one band is most likely they're, they're gonna end up with Lyme when you do further testing and all of a sudden you start treating them, get their immune system up, all of a sudden they'll, they'll light up the bands. But uh, even the 41, which they say is, is uh, has a high uh, likelihood of false positive, but here's the thing, like where do these bands come from, you know? They've been exposed to these, and some can be a cross-react to certain things, but uh, we're finding in one band, more, more likely than not, that person to end up having a confirmed line. Then you want to provocate before doing the um, uh, Western blots, because what Lyme is very stealthy, so your body doesn't see it. And studies show that the sicker the patient, the less bands, you know, so um, you want to either treat with antibiotics or end or peptides boost the immune system, then the body, uh, when you start killing it, the body can recognize it, and all of a sudden, the test becomes much more sensitive. Does the Western blot specific enough to differentiate between different spirochemes? Well, that's a problem, too. The only, uh, the, the standard is looking at two strains. So some of the more specialty tests have broader range of strains. Do you think you want to go to uh, so just if you remember the so the three key ones, low natural killer cell function, elevated C4A, elevated human growth factor beta, um, use of a cation protein, high sensitivity for obesia, but again you may have to treat first, immune activation of coagulation, uh, then also the low immune cell function, uh, low CD57, elevated VEGF. The problem is the VEGF needs uh, a kind of precise handling and uh, so if it comes out zero it's you it's, it's worthless so we're having that more and more we talk to the medical director but uh, at quest but um, if it's normal range okay it's a good test often if it, it's if it's high they have like blue bartonella in a low IG subclass and ace above 30 in this uh, looking at what tests are best is a combination of sensitivity specific uh, specificity and logistics, um, and uh, just basically what we found actually kind of gets to the bottom of it quicker. And uh, I did not include any specialty tests um, like uh, hygienics or DNA connection. There's a lot of new tests. They had a, a culture, but that's they've had to pull it back for a while. Um, labs are getting tough too. They have to try to stop everything. So you guys have this in your uh, folder there, or they're, they're on the table. Again, goes through what each condition, like what each peptide is good for. So you can see immunity, inflammation, anti-aging, weight loss, cognitive, antioxidant, sleep, and then the dose. The dose on the LL37 is wrong, so it needs much lower. That's it. All right, I <laughs> got a lot of blank stares on wording. Yeah. Yeah, we've uh, we do it via webinar, and uh, so we go through, and even you know some of the peptides like you do, you can spend you know 
200 slides on each peptide, but we, we do kind of an um, uh, intro talk and then for Lyme, chronic fatigue syndrome, those things to get a little more detail. And it, it takes a while, it's, it's actually very simple, but like anything, you gotta be, get comfortable with it. Um, we have a, I don't know, we put up the, you're gonna kill me. Um, put up the dosing on, we'll start people, BPC, again, ramping up on that, then starting thymus and beta-4, and then thymus and alpha-1 is kind of a starting point for everyone, so you can try those with some of your patients and, and see, get a feel for it. Um, Oh, it's, it's, it's key. I didn't have the slide, but again, um, they showed that, you know, uh, increasing TH1 is the key to successful treatment and well, the, the response and no relapse. So as soon as people have low TH1, they're going to relapse because, you know, the natural killer cell monitors the body for infection, but also cancer. So, you know, chemo, the problem is, you know, it kills all the fast growing cells, kills the immunity. I, you know, you can tell these people when you check anyone with is that chemo, low natural killer cell function. So uh, they really need immune boosting, and that's the key to prevent relapse or successful treatment. So, do you offer practitioner training programs on peptides? Yeah, yeah, we, we have it. We have it up already. And then is, is it online or in person or what? Yeah, are they still are they on the National County of Hypothyroid Yeah, there's I think the intro one, but we have. We have a bunch of them. Uh, what about some of your testing? Can you share some of your slides with us, or uh, in terms of what? I, I'd be interested in getting those lists of the tests that you're using. Uh, yeah, it was in the, in the slide. Oh, you want know I have one that's even more complete. I, I can I can shoot that over to you. Uh, Is it okay to share with the group? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, cool. Yeah. I have a lot more. Can you repeat this question? Yeah, so uh, asking about joint injections with AOD. Yeah, so again, AOD is the growth hormone fragment. Um, it has all the effects of growth hormone, but does not increase IGF-1, shorter acting, um, but so especially useful for joint injections. You're gonna get the effects of growth hormone in, in the joint. Um, and let's see, usually dosing for joint injections, I think it's in a 10 milligram vial, and then We'll put 0.2 to 0.5 cc's. Depending if you use multiple peptides, we'll lower the dose, but extremely safe. And you do that um, Well, usually we'll do it, you know, with something else and do it and see how they do. They may not need another one. Uh, yeah, you know, but peptides are fine with lidocaine. Um, it's the stem cells that issue with lidocaine. Have you seen anything with stem cells where people Stem cell qualities that people develop a lot of people. That, uh, sorry, people develop stem cell qualities? Yeah, not about the phenotype of the person they're getting the blood from. No, it's because again, it, it doesn't really go there and grow. Um, they, uh, so it's, it will, those will be gone in about 21 days. Yeah, well, we, we work with a couple that we can, um, so you would talk about it depends on what product you need and yeah. Yes. Did you say how you test for TH1, TH2? Yeah, so that's the TH1 low natural killer cell. Uh, it's simpler the other ones we went through, but and then TH2 is a C4A and human transforming growth factor beta. Uh, okay. Yeah. And uh, oh, here's what I should mention is that you know uh, in terms of uh, testing TH1, TH2 that you get these cytokine tests, and they're just so inaccurate. I've never seen them useful. <laughs> Silence. It does, but the powder yeah. that people, yeah, it's just very little absorbs and it's very expensive yeah. and they have a patent so no one else can do it. Um, That's so, the kind of thing you're talking about. Yeah, okay. it's, it's pretty much the same principle. Okay. Oh, hey. How's it going? Do they have these peptides that 
Definitely. Uh, we'll see the auto, all the autoimmune diseases uh, generally uh, will go down with, with the peptide. Um, you would think uh, thymus beta-4, but I'm, uh, usually we'll see a better response of thymus and alpha-1 uh, with that. But yeah, you'll often see uh, the dropping, but also you need to look for the chronic infection. And stem cells great for autoimmunity. Tons of studies on lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, so combining stem cells with the peptides, the peptides are going to be a cheaper option. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, the growth hormone's great, um, and but, you know, it seems the, reg the regulatory issues are much less, you know, for a while there they were, you know, it's the only drug you can't give for off-label use, so you can't give it for aging, you can't give it post-surgery, even though it works for all those things, you have to give it for growth hormone deficiency. But so the question is, what is growth hormone uh, deficiency? So um, I have a, I wrote a review article on growth hormone uh, that I can send out. Actually, it's in the, the little book there. There's a section on growth hormone. It talks about is there any cancer risk? No one's ever gotten cancer with any growth hormone. Um, uh, but it is in the thought that if the person already has cancer, that it would accelerate the growth? No. And the um, Growth Hormone Research Society, very conservative, they said, take it off the, um, the warnings that do not give it active cancer. It would be very safe, because also it really increases IGF-BP3, which is very anti-cancer. But I still wouldn't do it because there's there's medical and then medical legal and perception and things like that. So, um, and we're shying away from growth hormone using more of the, uh, usually we use CJC. Is it more IGF-1 associated with increased cancer growth? No, it, it, in a test tube. But I, I do, I don't give IGF-1 shots because I, I do think that may lead to long term. Although it's approved for kids and da 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 and it hasn't shown, but just um, mechanistically. I, I, I have to find with growth hormone, but I wouldn't do IGF-1, at least for long term. And then um, I was going to say, yes, yeah, so we've switched because of the regulatory issues, you know, and uh, especially do not write for it, dispense it out of your office, because uh, a lot of pharmacists will go, oh, it's a bodybuilding clinic and make a call. So that's why we shied away from giving growth hormone. It's just every month there's a price increase. Uh, so using, we do, there's a lot of secretagogues, um, and, but we, we found that CJC, Ipamoralin, seem to be the ideal. They're more specific, uh, they don't have other effects. So, but there's a lot of combinations. You know, uh, growth releasing peptide six, growth releasing you know, peptide two, uh, there's tons of them even in the growth hormone realm. Do you see um, a much short one? Growth increase with uh, giving. Uh, I see what increase. Sorry. Short bone. Short. No, I mean, uh, giving growth hormone. I, I'd say we've never had a. a you, you mean like the jaw and the forehead? Short bones are the ones that tend to be stimulated by growth hormone. Just when we're growing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have not had a patient who's rich enough to take that much. <laughs> uh, and it's you need to do massive doses. Do I? I do think a couple people got berry bonds. Uh, you know, his head got bigger. Uh, so it's possible, but you've got to be pretty rich. Um, I noticed this one here, Epithalon, mentions uh, telomere lengthening. Yeah. Now, is it actually lengthening the telomeres or is it slowing telomere attrition rate? It seems to actually lengthen them. Really? Yeah. It's really impressive. Okay, thank you. And yeah, and studies on, like studies on 65 year old, um, uh, people with significant cardiovascular disease, and the mortality rate went way down uh, by combining the epithelium and the uh, uh, thymic proteins, uh, so thymic peptides. Nice studies and uh, like you know, 80 percent reduction in cancer, 70 percent reduction in cardiovascular disease. They function better, and you're like, why? You know, why is everyone using it? What was that peptide that reversed heart failure again? Um, the, well, a number of them will, but again, stem cells probably see the best results oh, with, with stem cells uh, but also okay. thymus and beta-4, uh, sure. VPC, um, any, really any immune modulator can help it, but um, we find that's when we combine them usually stem cells and peptides. And something I kind of, uh, I seem to get better when the stem cells, but it was definitely better with just the peptides, although I didn't kind of run the same sort of thing. Thank <laughs> you.
just uh, mind blowing in a way. Um, is this something that somebody takes for a few weeks and then that's it? it or is it something that on for years and years, the rest of their life? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things like you look at the health benefits, you know, most people like to stay on it, they, they feel better. But if you're using it for a particular illness and it gets better, you can go off of it. But a lot of times, I mean, just from the environmental and, you know, if they have inflammation, hopefully that will all go down. They, you know, you can go off of it and see, see how long it takes. But uh, very easy to do or just cut it down to once a week or something like that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So the question is pancreatic cancer, I mean the success rate with treatment is, is very low. Um, but yeah, again, thymus and alpha-1 is approved for many cancers, so you, you know, check their immune system, and that's a key thing to do. I think with pancreatic cancer, you want to do kind of everything you can. Um, ozone, um, the, uh, what's the supplement, salvesterol. Uh, we've seen some good reports of that. People with metastatic um, um, uh, uh, melanoma reverses. Um, and then even the thymosin beta-4, BPC, um, yeah, the, the high-dose ozone. Um, let's see, what else? Do you have ozone in your office? Do we have ozone in the office? Yeah, 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 we do the 10 pass high dose. We find the higher doses are significantly better. Uh, El Segundo. Have you treated many patients with ALS? You know, I the problem is I don't see that many new patients anymore, so uh, unless someone brings it up now, but you know, over the years we've had a number of them with very good success. And it's funny, and they go back you to the same number. How many? Just ten. 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 Okay. Yeah, and then Parkinson's, that's Lyme. Um, and we even called Michael J. Uh, Michael J. Fox, and they're like, "No, he had Lyme, but was treated." Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, and that was just before we had the peptide system. So so, just doing all the other stuff uh, dramatically helped. And they go back to the neurologist, and they go, "Well, must have been a misdiagnosis." Well, you said you confirmed it. You know, that's it. They can't do anything, and it's crazy. And do they ever ask what you do? No. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, we spend, you know, I go, I'm, actually, I bill lower than everyone else because I spend four hours a week, but, um, yeah, it's, we give you a super billing. Okay, well, great. Thank you. Good. Thank you, guys.